over the last 15 years or so, really, you know, liquor and hard liquor in particular has been on an amazing tear and we're experiencing a truly, you know, new golden age for spirits and cocktails across the country and one could argue around the world. Um, and much of that growth has really been a direct result of the popularity of whiskey and, and, and in particular in America, Americans are rediscovering their love of whiskey. And as, you know, as whiskey drinkers have developed uh, now, a, I like to say sort of a progressively adventurous palate, you know, so it's not just whiskey from Kentucky or Scotland or Ireland or Japan, but, you know, it's new upstarts from all over the world, Taiwan, India, Brooklyn, um, you know, places that haven't traditionally made whiskey before. And really, um, why we're here, one of the industry leaders is, is Beam Satori, which is the world's third largest premium spirits company. And it owns many of my favorite spirits, but also many of the world's favorite, favorite spirits and revered brands, including, of course, Jim Beam, Maker's Mark, Knob Creek, Freud, Bomore, Akintoshin, Yamazaki, Habiki, Canadian Club, America's oldest whiskey brand, Old Overhalt, and really truly dozens and dozens of other brands that you'd all be familiar with. Our special guest today is uh, Max Shattuck, Chairman and CEO of Beam Centauri Inc. He joined Beam in March 2009 as President and CEO and led the company's transformation and emergence as a standalone public company in 2011, and then ultimately the acquisition by Centauri Holdings, Inc. Um, in 2014, Centauri Holdings Limited in 2014, and, and the subsequent integration of the new Beam Centauri uh, company. Um, really, uh, you know, uh, he's here to talk about how these two companies, two historic companies with really, you know, two legends in, in the whiskey industry who, who started them, you know, both Jacob Beam and Shinjiro Tori, who are both really fathers of, of the whiskey industry around the world. And I think it's a really interesting story how this company has merged this two, two amazing histories into one, into one business. So without further ado, Matt. Good afternoon, everybody, and Noah, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction and your great support uh, for our industry. Um, and it's a real honor to be speaking to the Japan Society today, and it's also an honor to be speaking to you in this very um, historic moment uh, for our nation. Uh, it's, uh, it's a time when I think uh, certain people have felt a great deal of joy, uh, others have felt a great deal of pain. Um, and I think it's a time some thought would never come about in their lifetime. It's a time, of course, I'm referring to when the Chicago Cubs won the World Series. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, today I'd like to uh, talk to you about, uh, as Noah said, the, the merger of, of two ostensibly very different companies who actually have come together. Uh, and despite having different histories and different philosophies, have actually come together and forged a successful path because actually they've got a great deal of commonality in their experience. And uh, I think it's because of the timeless values of both businesses that we've come together and really, as the title of our conversation today suggests, we've got the energy of a 220-year-old startup and we're looking forward to the opportunity to write the beginning chapters of the next 220 years of this extraordinary company that we're the stewards of. It was actually three years ago this week that I um, realized that Japan was going to take on a very different significance for me. And that's because on a visit to Tokyo, I met Gary Saji, the chairman of Suntory Holdings. And he invited me to his office and said that Suntory would like to buy Beam. And thence began a very intensive process, which uh, six months later, in April of 2014, resulted in the $16 billion acquisition of Beam by Suntory. And as Noah said, created the world's third largest premium spirits company, which we've called Beam Centauri. It represented, I think, a new beginning uh, for our business. I think it represented a new beginning for Centauri. Now, Centauri is an extraordinary company, and it traces its origins back to 1899. And it was then that a young 21-year-old entrepreneur called Shinjiro Tori opened his first wine shop in Osaka. 
Uh, he was a young pioneer, but he had a very bold ambition. And through the success of his first retail venture in 1923 in Kyoto, he designed and opened the first ever Japanese whiskey distillery. Um, now, the skeptic said it could be never done, and certainly he had a lot of trials and tribulations and a few failures, but because of a very, very strong uh, ambition, uh, a relentless pursuit of perfection, and an attitude of never giving up, um, he was very successful. And I think the best testament to the success of the industry he created back then is the fact that just two years ago, Yamazaki Sherry Cask uh, became noted as the best whiskey in the world, an extraordinary accomplishment. And I think that that persistence and that tenacity and that ambition is summed up in a phrase coined by Shinjiro Tori. He referred to it as Yataminahari. And in that, he encouraged all people in his business to dream big, to set ambitious goals, and to never give up, and to find all manner possible to remove obstacles in your path until they were accomplished. And that ethos runs through the business to this day. Now, Suntori has been a, a leading player in Japan um, since those times, but as you know, uh, and it's represented in this room for many Japanese companies, growth in Japan has been more and more challenging due to demographics. A declining and an aging population has meant that Suntory and many other businesses have had to look outside of Japan to sustain and propel their growth. And in Suntory's case, this was a driver of a great deal of acquisition activity, first in the soft beverage business between 2009 and 13. And then in 2014, the acquisition of Beam really did cement its position as a global company. Now, today, Suntory Holdings uh, has strong positions in, in categories as, as broad as spirits, beer, wine, soft drinks, but also in wellness products. And in 2015, the last full year of accounting for our uh, financials, uh, it did some $27 billion in sales. And more importantly, some 40% of that business occurred outside of Japan. So I suppose the question is, why did Suntory choose Beam uh, as its partner? Because We've got vast oceans and a lot of land that separate Tokyo and Chicago. And I think it's because of that shared history, the family heritage and the culture of bold ambition that these two companies came together and did so successfully. Uh, and Beam is a bit like Suntory. It's built upon about seven generations of pioneers who had a great deal of ambition and a great deal of that sort of pioneering spirit. Um, it went from Jacob Beam, who put his whiskey in the barrel in the wilds of Kentucky in 1795, through to his great-grandson, Jim Beam himself. And when Prohibition was uh, repealed in 1933 and the, the industry was really wrecked, he, with his own bare hands and at the tender age of 70, rebuilt uh, that distillery in just 100 days. And he passed the torch on through subsequent generations, through the ups and downs of the whiskey industry, and certainly his descendants still today, the seventh and eighth generation, are very much at the helm as we've been uh, enjoying this great bourbon renaissance that now referred to. Um, so I think it's um, one of its great descendants uh, is Booker No. He was a sixth generation family distiller. And he was another guy who was full of vision and ambition. He invented 20 years ago craft whiskey before the term craft had ever been used. Uh, he launched brands which we know and love today in our portfolio, for example, uh, Knob Creek and Basil Hayden. And another of the brands he launched back then was the eponymous Booker's. And I'm pleased to say that just a couple of weeks ago, uh, its rye expression has been named as the 2017 best whiskey in the world. So twice in three years, uh, one spirit made in Kyoto and another made in Kentucky have come together and I think speak to the idea that the forging of the DNA together of these two businesses is going to set us up for some very exciting things in the future. And in fact, that sort of heritage of Beam and those successive generations of unreasonable men and women is also very much summed up in another of our brands, and that brand is Maker's Mark. In 1953, Bill and Margie Samuels came together and they literally tore up the sixth generation old recipe because they believed the world needed a better whiskey. Uh, and so was born Maker's Mark, complete with its own very unique and iconic red wax seal, which actually Margie Samuels created with her own pots and pans in her own kitchen on the stovetop by melting wax in and dipping a bottle inside. So there you have it. In 2014, we came together with these two businesses, and I said, from different worlds, but with very similar roots. And I think that has been a foundation upon which we have in the past few years, and I think going forward, we'll build going forward. And really, as we look forward, um, I think there are two unique assets, which also are not just unique, they're probably the biggest sources of value creation we have in our company. Uh, first is our brands, and second, and more important, is our people. 
And obviously, when you are bringing a business together, as we had to in 2014, you can't go anywhere without a strong, engaged, aligned, and very motivated team of associates around the world. So as we began to bring this together and describe what we were going to do as one team, we looked back to that heritage, and we thought we could draw upon those things which we could point out which we had in common. And family heritage and pioneering spirit were very much at the heart of the way in which we crafted our vision and values. Now, when it came to articulating a vision, uh, we were very fortunate. There was a very natural and authentic way for us to adopt Suntory's vision, and that's simply described in three words, growing for good. It was another very great bequest from the visionary Shinjiro Tori. And he believed, in fact, he mandated that the company, literally from its inception in 1899, would exist for the good of all stakeholders, so our consumers, our customers, our colleagues, its owners, but as important as any of those, the societies in which uh, our businesses are situated. And that's something which, from the get-go, as we declared that as our vision, uh, the people of Beam found very compelling. Uh, they found it very compelling that Suntory was committed to preserving the Earth's natural resources, particularly water, because that is the essence of everything we make, and also a great commitment to giving back a significant proportion of its profits to society in all sorts of different and very productive ways. Um, at the same time, I think it's pretty clear to us that through changing times, it's actually constant values. And those values are expressed through the behavior of our founders and subsequent generations that have, I think, been the North Star that have kept both businesses on track and have been a great aid to us as we've put these businesses together. Um, and so when we got going, we said, what are the values that we're going to stand for? We articulated five core values in our business, uh, integrity, responsibility, quality, agility, and tenacity, all wrapped in that spirit of Yata Minahari, the phrase that Shinjiro Tori himself coined. And I think if I was to distill the behaviors that exemplify uh, those values, the best behaviors in our business that have driven our success and I hope will drive it in the future, there are three phrases I would, I would use to share those. The first is always putting people first. The second is challenging the status quo. And the third is doing the right thing. So what I'd like to do now is illustrate each of those with a few stories. So the first behavior that characterized our company over the years uh, was all about putting people first. Now, I will tell you at a personal level, I had the privilege of growing up with a great leadership role model, and that was my father. Uh, my dad spent 42 years as a cop in the British police. He went from being a bobby on the beat to being the chief constable of one of the biggest police forces uh, in the United Kingdom. And from an early age, I can remember him speaking of, but also acting upon his core belief that the most important job we have as leaders is to take care of the people that we're privileged to lead. And today, in his 81st year, my father spends a great deal of his time looking after his former colleagues and their families, particularly those that have fallen on hard times. And whilst I'll never be, never be the, the leader my father is, I've sought to bring some of those standards into my time as a leader, from my time in the British Army, where I was an officer, uh, from the time leading a public company, and now in this extraordinarily privileged role of being at the helm of the great combination that we call Beam Suntory. And I think that when it comes to people, one of the big factors we had in our early success was our ability to draw a team that was drawn from both Beam and Suntory and from all of the corners of the global business that we now represented. And one of those individuals uh, was my good friend, Windy Kwaizumi. Windy was the president of Japan. And when we brought our leadership team together in April of 2014, Windy did not speak a word of English. And yet, through sheer commitment and determination and investment of his own considerable time, he learned enough English to be an effective contributor. And in fact, in those early months, was incredibly helpful because he taught us what it meant to do business in the Japanese way. He taught us a great deal about Suntory's culture. And certainly at our quarterly two-day meetings, I would see him work twice as hard as the rest of us to understand what was being said, to translate, and then contribute. And contribute he did. And I think he is, and it's very interesting, I think, for this audience, a great example of an executive who will be a very effective leader of international business going forward, and probably a lot of it as a result of that experience that he's gaining on that team. And I think that speaks to um, another of the benefits um, of, of putting people first, and that is our ability to embrace and exploit our differences. I was in um, Tokyo for a meeting two weeks ago, and I had dinner with our international team, and I looked around the room, and there were 12 people from the international leadership team there, and I realized as I counted, they represented 10 different nationalities, Russian, German, American, Japanese, French, Spanish, British, Australian, Indian, 
And in fact, there were two Lebanese there as well. Extraordinary. And I think it's the diversity of that team as well as their inherent talent and the fact they've got an excellent leader, which has really caused them to hit the ground running in this new venture of ours. And they've really done an outstanding job in, in the last couple of years. And I'm absolutely sure they're going to do so going forward. One last anecdote on the importance of putting people first. When Beam became a public company back in 2011, the most important thing that the board of directors demanded of me was to go out and forge relationships um, with other people in our industry. Obviously, that's the usual customers and suppliers. But also, we had to do that with our peers. And that's particularly important in the spirits industry because it's not consolidated. And therefore, alliances play a critical role in one's growth journey. Now, at that time, Suntory had long been the largest spirits company in Japan, um, and at that time, they distributed one of our biggest competitors, although it, they did have a few of our smaller brands. And I was lucky enough to um, meet Gary Saggi early on, and whilst they had no immediate plans to change distribution partner, we took the business we did have, and we used that to forge a good working relationship and get to know each other's cultures and way of working and understand how we might create value together. And lo and behold, two years later, uh, when that distribution agreement was up for renewal, they chose not to renew it and partner with Beam. And I'm sure that that was probably a contributing factor in their decision to go for Beam, because they got to know us and understand what the business was about. Um, and then rather than tear this business apart and look for the synergies that many people do in acquisitions, they did the opposite. They did us the honor of saying, we'd like to combine the Japanese spirits business and the Beam spirits business, put it together, and actually locate the headquarters uh, in Chicago. An unbelievable act of generosity and faith in us, and one in which we are, we are doing our very best to repay each and every day. So as we've come together, we've certainly formed bonds as a new team. Our seventh generation family distiller on the Beam side is a famous man. His name is Fred No. And everybody that has the opportunity, and I commend you to do this, to visit the family distillery of his down in Claremont, Kentucky, is greeted by a sign. And it says, come as a friend, leave as family. And I think that's certainly the case for us. We came together as friends. And very much now, we feel like we're becoming members of one Beam Suntory family. The second manifestation of our values in the behavior of our people is all about challenging the status quo. And throughout our history, through the past 200 years, we've found a constant need to find new ways to grow by combining those core assets and capabilities with new insights and ideas so we can meet the needs of an ever-changing and ever more competitive landscape with our markets and, and with our consumers. Um, the first example I'll give you here is, is in Japan. And, and after reaching its peak in about 1983, the Japanese whiskey business was on a decline. It was out of consumer trend. There were some economic and other taxation factors which contributed to that decline. But Suntory um, didn't accept that. And they found a very ingenious way to turn that around. And in fact, it was about 2008 at a bar in the Shimbashi district of Tokyo that some of the Suntory sales team observed there were consumers drinking highballs instead of beer. Now, a highball uh, is simply a mixture of whiskey, and club soda and a lot of ice. And they noticed it was a very refreshing drink and it paired particularly well with food. And they said, you know, this is a big opportunity. If we can provide a refreshing alternative to beer, we, we can really do something with this. And in a very typical Suntory way, they worked in a painstaking way to develop, test, and refine to what they thought was the perfect highball. And I think that really speaks to this concept in Suntory of continuous improvement and an obsession with getting quality absolutely right. And the great news is that that did absolutely turn around that business. And to this day, there's a very significant demand in Japan for that heartland Japanese whiskey, and that's being driven by the highball. But that insight also led to commercial opportunity and in our integration. Uh, as we brought the two companies together. And as a result, we've adapted the highball towards bourbon as a drinking style in Japan. Um, and as a result, we've now turned Japan into the fastest growing market for Jim Beam. And just to scale that for you, in the year before the acquisition took place, uh, we sold about 350,000 bottles of Jim Beam in Japan. This year, we will sell 6 million. And if we look at the trajectory of growth of that business, I'm absolutely sure it'll continue that when we get to the Tokyo Olympics in 2020, uh, Japan will have become the biggest export market for the Jim Beam brand. Uh, and there's no doubt it wouldn't happen without that combination. Another brand that uh, has found uh, interesting ways to challenge the status quo uh, is Maker's Mark. Uh, indeed, one of its uh, high points after that early launch I talked about in 1953 was in 1980. Um, and it was, a, it was a very important milestone uh, for the brand's history because the Wall Street Journal 
um, had a leader article and it said in its headline, Maker's Mark goes against the grain to make its mark. And this is a brand that's uh, inefficient by choice. Um, it's the only distillery that rotates all of its barrels. So you need a bigger distillery for the same amount of, a bigger warehouse for the same amount of barrels. Um, every label is, is hand torn. Every bottle is hand dipped to give it that unique signature wet wax, which Margie Samuels invented. And when it came time to expand capacity, rather than trying to squeeze more out of the capacity we had, we built an identical distillery next to the one already in place so that we could get the identical product out of it. Um, well, the team in Maker's Mark have come up with another great way this year of, of challenging the status quo um, with a premium uh, whiskey innovation called Maker's Mark Private Select. Now, this is when we bring individual customers, maybe from hotels or bars or high-end restaurants, down to Loretta, Kentucky, and we give them a chance to finish their own version of Maker's Mark by personally selecting a range of oak staves, which we then put into the barrel, and then we put the whiskey back into the rack house for the last few months of aging. And in fact, the options available mean there's about a thousand different flavor combinations. So truly, every individual bar or restaurant could have their very own version of Maker's Mark. Now, over time, it's good to use the highs and lows of temperature for the aging of whiskey over years. But over months, you need a constant temperature, and we don't have that. So again, in a first of its kind, the ingenious team in Maker's Mark have actually created the first ever limestone cave by literally excavating the side of a hill at the back of the distillery and building a beautiful place where our customers can come and blend and then store their whiskey before it's ready and matured. And I need to say, this innovation has been really successful in its first few months and is off to a great start. And then the final example I'd give you of a brand that challenges convention in an entirely different way is, is our brand Laphroaig. Um, you may not know Laphroaig, it's the world's number one Isla malt scotch, uh, and it comes from the island of Isla off the west coast of Scotland. This is a brand that has a big, smoky, peaty taste with a lot of character. Uh, and that is not a taste for everyone. In fact, I think it's one of those brands you either love or you hate. So rather than the brand team choosing to go out and tell the world how great Laphroaig was, uh, they talked to the people who love this brand and asked them to tell us about their unique relationship with the brand and their opinions. And they launched a campaign simply called Opinions Welcome with these direct quotes, which are real quotes from real consumers. And I'll just give you a sample of the sort of advertising that you might not normally think about, but when you're challenging the status quo, you might otherwise do. Um, so three of my favorites. It tastes like a kiss from an angel wearing charred leather. <laughs> it's like sticking your face in a peat bog and inhaling deeply. And my favorite, like smoking a fine cigar in the middle of a hurricane while riding a whale. Um, so this is um, a campaign that's won a lot of awards and praise, and that's all very well and good. But as importantly, and probably more importantly, it's driven some great growth for this brand, and we see that continuing for many years to come. And then to conclude, the third behavioral trait I'd like to talk about is doing the right thing. As I said earlier, um, our people were really uh, enthusiastic about adopting the vision of, of growing for good. Uh, and looking after all of our stakeholders, uh, particularly the impact we could have on the societies in which we're all privileged to live and work. And we do this, and we live that value in a number of ways. We do it by protecting uh, the world's uh, and, and the Earth's natural environment. Uh, we do it by supporting our communities, and we also do it by promoting responsible consumption of our products. Um, when it comes to water, again, Suntory sets a great example here. For example, it has a program ongoing to educate young people, children, on the important and the essential power of water in society. Um, in Japan, it also preserves uh, forests which are located around our distilleries, our breweries, our bottling plants in a way that can actually be a source of natural regeneration for water uh, to put through those particular facilities. And in fact, each employee in Japan participates one day a year on actively pursuing that endeavor and looking after those forests and what we've called natural water sanctuaries. And in fact, so successful an idea is that and so compelling to our people, we're rolling that idea into our distilleries in Kentucky as we speak. Um, another aspect of uh, growing for good is empowering our people to work in their local communities on those causes and with those institutions which are most dear and important to them. So we really do think that it's important to let our people do things which they feel matter to them and those around them. In fact, we give each of our employees two days paid holiday a year 
to conduct community service. Now, whether you're in Madrid or Sydney or London or Chicago, that adds up to about 70,000 days a year, which we can offer in terms of community service. At the same time, we like to um, have partnerships with a number of institutions. One of those uh, in the United States is with Operation Homefront. Operation Homefront is a wonderful charity. It looks after the service men and women in the armed services, particularly those who are way on active duty and looks after their families back home. And within Operation Homefront, I'm proud to say there's a particular program called Meals for the Military, which was the result of the behavior of one of our leaders. Uh, we have a gentleman in our sales organization called Ken Ruff. And uh, back in 2009, Ken was in a uh, supermarket in upstate New York. And he, it was just before Thanksgiving. And he was standing behind uh, a young serviceman and his wife and young child. And when it came time to pay for their groceries for Thanksgiving, they didn't quite have enough money. And he very quietly and humbly reached around and paid their bill and said, thank you for your service. And as he walked out, he said, you know, this is a great idea. And since then, Operation Homefront has turned his sort of gracious gesture of gratitude into a program such that uh, our people and others will now visit about 25 bases across the breadth and depth of the US. Last year, before Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays, they served some 8,500 families with the full meal kit for their Thanksgiving. And this year, they hope to rise to some 10,000. And the last example of um, our commitment to responsible consumption is, 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 I think, another one which is very important to us. We do this in a number of ways. We sponsor programs and partnerships and associations. Um, it's all about the responsible marketing of our products. Uh, it's about alcohol education. It's about reducing drunk driving and underage drinking. And in fact, over the last decade, uh, we've spent about uh, $20 million in that endeavor. And that's a commitment which we will maintain with Suntory going forward. Uh, and probably the, the, the most recent example I can give you of that is that just last week, uh, to my opening comments, we became the uh, designated driver for all of Chicago. We offered some 10,000 free Uber rides for the fans attending the, uh, the World Series at Wrigley Field so they could go home safely. So to conclude, um, I hope I've given you a sense that through our shared vision and values, I think we've come together and we've been fortunate to hit the ground running. A lot of integrations of this type don't always go well and don't deliver uh, their economic commitments. And I think that's because we've had a successful commercial integration, but I think more importantly, we've had a very successful culture integration. And we're here as this 220 year old startup and we're ready to sort of embark on that next leg of our continuing journey. And whilst we've got a strategy which is far and wide about how we cultivate our brands and our markets and generate the efficiency and effectiveness agenda to fuel our growth, um, in that strategy, people are and always will be our number one priority. And it's funny, we, we, um, we have a long and storied history. And what I find fascinating is I go around the world and I talk to all of our colleagues in Beam Suntory. There is one sort of central idea that gets us out of the bed in, in the morning. And everybody feels this. And that is that we're just custodians of a living legacy. Um, and our job is to be good stewards of that legacy, to nurture and protect it. But also our job is hopefully to add something to it. That's our purpose. And if we're successful in that endeavor, we hope and believe that maybe in 10, 50, 100 years time, they might look back on the Beam Suntory team of 2016 and say, wow, they did a good job. They made their mark and they grew this business for good. And if we do that, I am absolutely convinced that it's because through changing times, it's those constant values. And it's the expression and the living of those values through behaviors, such as putting people first, and such as challenging the status quo, and such as doing the right thing that will ensure we get there. And for me, probably the final little story I'll leave you with is this, which I think sums up the ethos of this extraordinary company we're part of. Um, Suntory's current chairman, as I said, is Gary Shaji. He is Shinjiro Tori's grandson. And his big dream was to create a truly global company. That's why he made the audacious move to acquire Beam back in 2014. In fact, this was the second largest acquisition of an American company by a Japanese company ever at that time. So I joined Chairman Saji at a press conference in Tokyo uh, in the spring of 14, just after the deal had been completed. And there were about 226 journalists there. And inevitably, the question eventually came. And one of the journalists said to him, Chairman Saji, did you pay too much for Beam? And he very calmly and politely and elegantly said, no, $6 billion is not too, $16 billion is not too much to pay to pursue a dream. So my message to you all today is, here's to dreaming big. Thank you.
Thank you for uh, the sharing the story of, of the merger and, and both companies. I mean, it's pretty fascinating. Um, you know, in these, this era, we, we talk a lot about craft spirits and mm -hmm. different craft companies, and, and one could argue that both Beam and Centauri were crafts, almost yeah. the definition of craft brands. Do you think that the craft brands that we're seeing today will one day be the next Beam Centauri? Well, I think it's a very exciting uh, thought behind that question because what I like about the fact is there is a real entrepreneurial zeal in the growth of craft and as I said I think that plays right back to our roots now I think in any of these movements I think you'll see it in craft beer and craft spirits very few will probably make it through and scale to that point but sure. I'm sure some will and I think what's good about that is it's good for the industry because innovation and growth and ideas are what propels our industry and I think it keeps us on our toes and we've got to keep innovating and stay true to those traditions but at the same time we welcome uh, newcomers because I think they will as I said be the lifeblood of the future growth and that's really what we really care about. Well and, and talking about future growth and innovations one of the, one of the things that you sort of pioneered when, when Beam was a standalone company was a lot of really interesting new brands, Skinny yeah. Girl, the Red Stag yeah. initiative. And, and do you think that obviously a lot of the flavored variants of the Jim Beam brands have done yeah. very well in the last couple yeah. of years. Do you think Beam and also the whole industry has been able or, or is, 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 is going to be able to sort of turn those drinkers of the, the flavored whiskeys yeah. one day, the Red Stag drinker, the mm -hmm beam apple drinker one day into a drinker of Knob Creek or Laphroaig or Agintosh? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think because if we can encourage people to come in and, and, and Fred No says, you know, how should you drink bourbon? He says, any damn way you please. <laughs> and uh, I think we should be very relaxed about that. And I think sometimes other um, styles of whiskey are perhaps a little bit more restricted in how they can see it being used. Ooh. I think bourbon's uh, versatility, its natural taste makes it very mixable. It mixes with flavors. It mixes, as I said, in a highball very well. And I think as people come in, they can then begin a process of discovery. And I think you're right. A number of those, as they go through their journey, will ultimately uh, migrate into uh, to other styles. And I think uh, if we can find ways for them to do that, then that's a great opportunity. I think Booker, uh, at least according to Fred, uh, Booker, you know, once somebody said to him, do you mind people drinking, you know, Booker's in a, in a bourbon and Coke? And Booker said, it's just the best damn bourbon and Coke they'll ever have. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so he, uh... he, didn't, he didn't stand on ceremony. Well, I mean, obviously, you know, Beam is famous for its, its American whiskeys. You know, Centauri, you know, is famous for its Japanese whiskeys. Mm. A lot of your portfolio is, is, is whiskey based, which, yeah. is, which is fine for me because I love whiskey. But do you think that, that the brand overall, I mean, you, you do have vodkas and, and mm -hmm. gins and rums, yeah. but do you think that you're too heavily weighted in, in the whiskey category? Uh, I, I don't. I, I think balance is important because all industries and segments go in cycles. Uh, we do over half our business today in whiskey, and we've got these fantastic cornerstones of bourbon uh, and Japanese, but also our, our Scottish malts, you know, with sure. the Beaumorts and Laphroaigs and the Ardmores. Um, we also, though, do have other great brands. So, for example, tequila for the Legacy Beam was the second uh, biggest category after, after bourbon. And so we have brands like Sousa and Hornidos. And at the moment, we're again seeing a very similar movement that we've seen in whiskey, which is a, a, a greater, you know, some, you know, hitherto, I think a lot of people saw tequila as just something you drank in a shot late at night. Sure. And now there's a real appreciation of the craft of, of tequila and different styles and flavors. And so I think having that, obviously, um, in this country, uh, vodka is very important. It's still about 29% of the market, and we have a wonderful brand called Pinnacle, another one called Effen. So I think we, we need to make sure that we have a portfolio that can cater to all needs and occasions and consumers, but I would still say the heart and soul of our business is as a whiskey business, and I think it's our job to make that our first priority every day. Well, I, I think that you, know, you were talking before about the success of Jim Beam in Japan, but mm. over the last few years, Japanese whiskey has I mean, been on fire in America. Mm. And, I mean, uh, it's the fact that we were discussing before that in, you know, the Hibiki brand has gotten extremely popular with bartenders and whiskey aficionados. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. one of your colleagues, I think last week, was talking about how it would take maybe a decade for the Japanese whiskeys, you know, mm -hmm. for you guys to produce enough to yeah. meet future demand. Do you, I mean, do you think it's almost 
has gotten too successful almost too quickly. Yeah, it's, 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 some say it's a nice problem to have, but I think what Absolutely. we, I think we gotta be, I think that's where we have to be um, intelligent about how we get that. So, right. you know, um, thinking about some of the more premium expressions, uh, we've launched Suntory Toki in this market, yeah. which is a blend, and one of Suntory's extraordinary skills is blending, and no and I just, as we were having lunch, were talking about that, and that's a great ability to ensure that the liquid you have is, is made of the highest quality, but also gives you an opportunity to, to get a bit more out of it. And so I think if we, if we do that, and then we continue to invest, which we are, in the future growth, I think we'll be able to sustain it. Uh, but we'll have to do it in a really disciplined way. I know, obviously, you know, in Japan, you guys have, have two distilleries, and in America, there are plenty more facilities. Do you ever foresee yourselves, you know, uh, opening more distillers in Japan, like in, 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 in other places? Or Yeah, know? at the moment, I think, I, I, in the short term, I said no, because we, we, we have this wonderful asset, uh, Hakushu, which is up sure. in, 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 in the hills on the mountains near Mount Fuji and, and produces a very different style, which is very much from the forests. Um, and obviously, we have the Cheetah Distillery, which is a bigger distillery. And actually, we've launched recently a single grain from there, which is, right. which is a very nice product. And obviously, the Yamazaki Distillery um, up in Kyoto. So I think for the time being, using what we have and building upon that is probably the, 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 the way we'll go. Um, my name is George Bulow. I'm an entrepreneur in the United States. Uh, my family has long been in the whiskey business, going back to Seagram following uh, in the 1940s and going forward. So I've always been in and around the business, but never of it. Uh, my question is that of uh, in vertical integration. You now have an industry with giants, and even though there are lots of uh, crafts and other smaller distillers and constantly growing like mushrooms and much as you've described what you've talked about. I'm wondering about such aspects of integration as uh, common warehousing or uh, it's more prosaic things but things like cooperage or, uh, or other issues or purchases of grain or whatever is needed in creating the product and how much integration for a worldwide company can there and should there be and how much needs to be continued mm -hmm. localized. Yeah, I think that it, it's like um, anything else in business. Those things, our focus and our obsession has to be on quality and sustaining that quality over time. Uh, so inevitably, if you take, for example, bourbon, bourbon is the only spirit in this country which is controlled by an act of Congress. Every drop of bourbon, as opposed to American whiskey, but every drop of bourbon has to be made uh, from a 51% corn mash bill, and it has to be matured in brand new American white oak barrels. And so we have a partnership with American Stave, who are the biggest coopers uh, in this country, and they are extraordinary craftsmen. They take the sustainability of the environment and the wood that they use for those barrels very seriously, and that's our partner. Um, so I can't imagine us ever uh, procuring those, uh, those barrels from anywhere other than where we do now, because that's such a part of what we do and the flavor that has been so unique to our brand over the years. Um, and likewise with other materials. If it makes sense for us to have a procurement of something which is more commodity-like on a global basis, we'll do that. But we won't do anything in pursuit of scale, which in any way uh, runs in the, in the opposite direction of that local and very proprietary quality, because each of our distilleries has a very unique set of characteristics and skills. Some of it is art, some of it is science, and that sort of essence is something that we must be incredibly conscious of, while at the same time hoping that we will find the benefits of scale in areas which don't require that proprietary uh, aspect to them. And we see, places, like in on Isla, all of the different Scottish distillers there use, I think, a central peat bog, yeah. uh, you know, and, or certain uh, cooperages are used Absolutely. in Kentucky or Scotland, or the actual the maltings. Few yeah. people actually do the maltings anymore, yeah. but it, it's, it's usually a third party who's, who's mm -hmm. providing that. Mm -hmm. Cool, right in that corner. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm Jason Olison from Sumitomo Corporation, uh, and uh, we obviously are a globally diversified conglomerate ourselves, so we are constantly dealing with acquisitions and mergers all over the world in various industries. And I'm going to pick up a bit on the previous question. Uh, obviously, with the marriage of two great companies like Beam and Suntory, uh, these are comp companies that had two very strong but distinct corporate cultures, uh, world-class but very different approaches to management and so forth. Just, I guess, taking this a bit to the macro level, what were some of the challenges that Beam Suntory has experienced that come to mind uh, in terms of integrating these two types of uh, firms sort of at the corporate culture level 
globally, and how are you engaging in dealing with those issues? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, I, I, I tried to speak to that a little bit in, in my comments, because obviously you see some very obvious differences in terms of Japanese business protocols, language, and other aspects of the business. But I think what's helped us is it's this huge degree of commonality. Um, and it's about um, a respect for family heritage and being good custodians. It's about an entrepreneurial spirit. And I think what comes from that is whilst we both had quite a high degree of centralization for certain aspects of our business and functions like finance and accounting, we strongly believe, as does Suntory, that you empower people as close as possible to the consumer and customer as you can. And that tends to be to the previous question where we make things proprietary, whether it's in our distilleries or whether it's in our markets. It's those things which are closer to the center and which coalesce around more transactional goods and services that we're able to bring together. And so I think what was helping us was that whilst a distillery in Kyoto and a distillery in Claremont, Kentucky might appear very different on the surface, you'd find that those distillers had way more in common with each other than they might do with other members of their own company's community. And I think it is that uh, cultural uh, essence and that cultural sort of fit that, el that enables to get through that. So once we got through, uh, obviously, challenges of language, protocol in meetings, how to actually listen, and, and Americans' proclivity to go a bit fast and, and, uh, and get on with things, and, and a more considered approach that, that I think we've learned a great deal from in the Japanese. Once we got through some of those behavioral norms, we found the cultural underpinnings and the essence of the company uh, was able to drive a lot of synergies. And we've generated, we have generated a lot of value, both on the cost and the revenue side. But I think they came from our similarity, not from our difference. Hi, Matt. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I thought that was a fantastic presentation, so I appreciate you coming in. Uh, I'm an MBA candidate at uh, Cornell University. My name is Jim Andretta. Um, the question that I have is about brand equity. Um, so you're building two very different um, sort of consumer perceptions, both, both here in North America and also in Japan. I think that you have very different challenges considering the scarcity of product here uh, in America versus uh, in Japan where Jim Beam is more readily available. So I'm curious how you're building brand equity uh, and, ex and exactly what the challenges are in both of these two very different markets. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. We, we actually don't have a, a, a restricted supply of, of Jim Beam in this market. I mean, it, we, I mean, we're growing well, but we're managing to, to keep up with demand. But I think part of the essence of building a global brand is to come back to what I said in my uh, conversation. I think brands are built on values, and I think they express those values by telling stories about where they come from. So if you see our current campaign for Jim Beam, uh, it's called Make History, and it's a way that we can describe the heritage and the authenticity of the brand. But then we can apply it locally, and we give our teams on the ground certain guardrails, but then we can apply it to local custom and culture. When you add on top of that, that there might be a different preference in drinking styles, and Noah talked about, say, flavored bourbon, that's certainly been, with a brand like Jim Beam Apple, a big focal point for the states over the last year, whereas in Japan, we've been really pushing uh, the Jim Beam highball. So I think that combination um, of being sort of consistent where we should be consistent around values and heritage and quality and those basic tenets of what a brand stands for, but then locally adaptable to the way in which we describe that to local consumers and the way in which we might recommend them to enjoy the brand. I think if you get that balance right, um, that is better than just trying to apply one size fits all for everybody everywhere. Well, I remember being down in your... Uh Innovations Lab, which is a whole huge facility yeah. in uh, in Kentucky, and there's a whole uh, mock kind of grocery store with all of these Jim Beam products I'd never seen before, and a lot of them were for Germany or other places, Absolutely. and you know uh, that were very specific to the market. Which was yeah. kind of fascinating to see yeah. all types of ready to drink stuff yeah. and yeah. Uh, bottles. So. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's that you know I when I was in Unilever, <laughs> great phrase which I love. One of our uh, uh, CMOs once said, he said, if you're running a global business, he said, you've got to find that balance between being mindlessly global and hopelessly local. <laughs> and yeah. uh, I think there is a sweet spot now, depending on the philosophy of your company and the industry you're in. But I think if you can find that sweet spot, you, you, you can maximize. Certainly in consumer goods, that's the way to maximize value. I think we have time for one last one. Dan? Thanks, Matt. This is uh, Dan Marsteller with Schenken News. Uh, yeah, I believe uh, Mr. Ninami had referenced the possibility of um, 
doing some collaborative products between the Japanese and American sides of the business recently. I just wondered if you had any idea what sort of shape that might take and you know how far down the road we might be talking about. Yeah, um, look, I think we are, even though we've, we've been at this now for, for two and a half years, we're just beginning every day to discover the power of the combination of these two businesses. And obviously, areas such as product innovation will be one of those. Um, obviously, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to talk uh, about the sort of ideas we've got. Obviously, that's proprietary, and it's something that we'll, we'll not talk about publicly. But I will say, yeah, I think what Nanami san said is, is, is right and powerful. And I think as we go forward, uh, we should be looking at ways to, to bring that similarity and difference together, because I think it's the intersection of similarity and difference when great innovation takes place. So uh, more to follow uh, in, in the months and years ahead. On the, on the heels of the Mizunara Bowmore uh, edition of retirement. Yeah. I think we have time for one last question here. Thanks, um, Zachary Sachs of Oppenheimer Funds. Um, there's been a lot of press over the summer about the challenges uh, between the two groups, um, Beam and Suntory, Mr. Nimami saying that he was, quote, the head of the Suntory holdings or the head of the Suntory group. And I guess it seems that, um, I, I just wonder what are the differences from being under the auspices of Fortune Brands to Suntory? I know that we talked, you know, you talked a lot about, you know, the similarities of the companies, but it seems that on the ground, at least in some of the press coverage, um, you know, things aren't as, things aren't going as well. Um, and I guess, and I guess in a related question, you know, you've lost a lot of colleagues, right, um, from being whether it's a CFO, chief marketing officer, um, you know, and other heads of divisions. I guess can you comment on IPO and and things around that, um, and and perhaps why those senior management have um, left the organization? Yeah, well, there's a lot in that question. Um, I will tell you, I think that was that one press article was overblown and overstated and probably didn't represent. Um, what I think has gone on, which I think has been an extraordinary success. I think it's um, exemplified by the results we've delivered. We continue to outperform uh, our competitors and our market. Uh, and I think we do so, as I said, with a culture which is growing stronger every day and with a very engaged and motivated team. Inevitably, there are growing pains in any venture. Uh, but I will tell you, if you were to speak to the people on the ground, you would find some very engaged and motivated people who are very excited about being part of a bigger company. We, we've had the opportunity to do a lot of work on training and cross-fertilizing with people working uh, in both sides of uh, the Pacific, and, and that will continue going forward. And there's a ton of collaboration, which I think is a great way to drive people together. Um, inevitably, when you have an event uh, such as a big sale, certain people will make a decision. You know, our CFO wanted to, without speaking for Bob, who's a great friend of mine, wanted to still be at the helm of a public company, and he's doing a wonderful job there, and our, our HR uh, head made a different personal decision. I think the challenge is, so where do you go from there? And a combination of great internal bench, but also, um, you know, we have a new uh, CMO, her name is Rebecca Messina, who's just come to us in the past year from Coca-Cola. Uh, we've got world-class talent in our business, both organic and inorganic, and uh, I'm very proud of that team and delighted by the fact they want to come and work in this great industry. So uh, we're going there, and when it comes to um, where that leaves us for IPO and other speculations, I mean, that's very much a question for Suntory and the family who own this business, and, uh, you know, it's not something I am in a position to talk about. I will tell you, though, I'm a member of the Suntory board, and I have thoroughly enjoyed that experience. And uh, as the only non-Japanese on that board, I feel welcome and very much part of that uh, organization. And, and I'm very proud to, uh, to have that as part of my, my title in this business. Well, well thank you all for coming. Uh, I thank you for the Japan Society for hosting us. Uh, I think there is a sample of some Jim Bean for people to take for every one of you. So remember to collect that on your way. And I thank you so much. Thank you.